Hey everybody, welcome back to Environmental Organic Chemistry with Dr. Lisa. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna do uh, sort of an example of how to do homework problem number seven. I'm gonna choose a chemical that is not one of the ones that any of you guys had to use for your homework. Uh, and hopefully this will help you get through the homework. So um, the homework here is about the partitioning of some large hydrophobic chemicals in the New York, New Jersey Harbor. And I'm not making this stuff up. This is like for reals. Uh, there's this thing called the Contamination Assessment and Reduction Project, which is trying to predict the fate of chemicals all throughout the New York Harbor, which includes Long Island Sound, Raritan River, where we are, parts of the Raritan River, uh, the Newark Bay, parts of the Passaic, and the, the Hackensack Rivers, and up the Hudson River up to uh, the Troy Dam in Troy, New York. So this is where we live. And this is uh, the... It's run mostly by the Department of Transportation and the Port Authority because they're concerned about keeping the shipping lanes open. And to keep them open, you have to dredge the sediment out of them. And the sediment has all kinds of contaminants in it. And the things that settle in the sediment are big hydrophobic chemicals. And that's why each of you has a different chemical this week for your homework, because I needed to give you something big and hydrophobic. So this is the CARP summary report. If we go to page seven here. You can see that there's a whole list of contaminants that they modeled uh, in this sediment or this uh, in this project. Mostly we're focused on the PCBs, the dioxins, the PAHs and pesticides like DDT, for example. The rest are um, either inorganic metals or sediment or things like that. So we're focused on these large hydrophobic chemicals. But you can see they, they measured a lot of stuff. They, they did a lot of work on this project, a lot of chemicals. And if we go to page 10 here, this is a schematic of how the model system works. Uh, the first model is the hydrodynamic model, just to get the hydrodynamic dynamics right of where the water comes from and where the water goes to. Uh, then they have to get the sediment right, figure out where the sediment is coming from and where the sediment is going to. Then they have to get the organic carbon right, so they can figure out how much dissolved organic carbon and how much particulate organic carbon is in the system. And then they have to get the chemical fate right. So that's where we have to start calculating the, the um, partitioning of the chemical between the DOC, the POC, and the dissolved phase here. And then once they've done all of that, then they feed that into a bioaccumulation model, which explains how these chemicals bioaccumulate up the food chain into species like striped bass that we might want to catch and eat. So again, I'm not making this stuff up. This is like for reals. This is how they do they, these things. It's, it's uh, the homework is a little simplified compared to what they do, but it's not that much simplified. You might be surprised. Okay, so here's our homework seven. So I've decided to do this for PCB 52. This is one of the uh, very common PCB congeners found in the air cores that were manufactured by Monsanto. Uh, I went into the UFZ LSER data set and I was able to look at a log KOC value for this chemical of 4.74. And it actually had a delta H for octanol water partitioning in that UFZ LSER data set, which was 18 kilojoules per mole. And I'm going to assume that this is equal to this delta H for particular organic matter partitioning down here. So if I just take 10, 10 to the value of this log KOC. My KOC value is about 55,000. We certainly don't need all those decimal places, right? So that's question number one. Uh, by the way, I was also able to look up a session out constant in that UFZ LSER data set, had a session out constant. So go me. That, was, that made this pretty easy for your chemical. That information may or may not be there. Eh, you can always hope for the best. Um, Okay, so question that's question one. Question two is calculate a KOC value that is corrected for temperature and salinity. So my salinity was given at 0.3 molar. Uh, my session out constant is 0.31. So I can use this equation right here. So the ratio of KOC with salt and without salt is 10 to the KS times the salt. And we should put parentheses around that. Make sure that that's done correctly. And we get a value of about 1.24. So that makes sense. KOC is going up as salinity goes up because the salt is squeezing the chemical out of the water and forcing it onto the organic carbon. 
So that means that my KOC in the presence of salt is just that times the original KOC here. Okay, so now my KOC has gone up now about 68,000. And now I wanna do my temperature correction. Again, this is made much easier by the fact that I can look up a value of delta H for octanol water here, and I can reasonably assume that it's equal to the delta H for organic carbon to water partitioning. Uh, if you don't have a good value here, you're just gonna to have to guesstimate something. Um, the chemicals that you were given for this homework are all large hydrophobic chemicals, and so they should have some measurable delta H here. Shouldn't, shouldn't be zero, I don't think, for these chemicals because they're so large and, and hydrophobic. So here's my temperature one and temperature two. I've already converted it to one over T1 and T2. So my natural log of K at T2 divided by K at T1 is going to be equal to this thing. So that's my delta H divided by R. Notice that I'm using R. Sorry, you can't see it right here, but R is up here and it's in units of kilojoules per mole so that it matches the units of kilojoules per mole here times. And then this is always the tricky part. Got to make sure I get T1 and T2, right? This minus this. Okay, so that's my LN. So then my K at T2 divided by K at T, T1 equals the EXP of that. Make sure you get your logs and your EXPs right. This is natural log, so we're using the EXP of this. So that's 0.77. So that means that actually the, the KOC value is going down. So 0.77 times the KOC value I just calculated here for salt. And it turns out that there's, to a large extent, the salinity of the temperature sort of cancel each other out and you end up with pretty close to what you started with, about 50,000 for your KOC value. So that's a reasonable value of KOC corrected for salinity and temperature. Now we need to estimate KDOC from here. There's not really a great way to do this. Uh, I happen to be using a PCB and, and I've said in the lecture notes that for PCBs, you could assume that it's somewhere between 10 and 20% of the KOC. So I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna choose 20% here times your KOC. So, and these of course would have units of liters per kilogram. And this is liters per kilogram, very important to get that right. So that's a reasonable estimate of KDOC. And now we need to calculate the partitioning between all these different phases. So you were given the particulate organic carbon and the dissolved organic carbon. If I wanna convert these from milligrams per liter to kilograms per liter, so that the kilograms per liter will cancel with the liters per kilogram, then I need to take that number, sorry, that number, and multiply it by one to the 10 to the minus six here. And so we get very low values. That's to be expected. It's just the way it works. Uh, when you convert to kilograms per liter, these are going to be much smaller values. So you were given the equation for how to calculate the fraction that's in the dissolved phase. Uh, and I'm going to do kind of what we did on the other three phase partitioning problem, where I'm going to calculate the denominator here just to make my my formulas in Excel a little bit easier. So the denominator would be equal to one plus KDOC times the amount of DOC here, plus KOC times the amount of POC. So there's my denominator, pretty close to one because these are small. <laughs> so my fraction dissolved is then, that's easy. It's just one over that denominator. If I don't, yeah, okay, got it. Ah, sorry, Excel is flaking out on me. Equals one divided by the denominator. There we go. Uh, now, how do I calculate the fraction that's in the dissolved organic carbon phase? Well, this term here is what represents the part that's in the DOC phase. So I'm not gonna write out all the math because I think you guys can figure this out on yourself by yourselves, KDOC times the amount of DOC divided by the denominator here. That makes sense to me. And then by the same token, this part of the equation represents the amount that's in the, or the POC phase. So I'm gonna say uh, KOC times POC, oops, 
divided by the denominator. And so here I have, I'm going to turn these into percents, right? 93%, 3%, and 4%. And just to check, I'm going to add these up and make sure that they add up to 100%. And they do. Even if I go out to a thousand decimal places, they all add up to 100%. So I'm good. So just checking here. Check. Okay, uh, so this is an example, you know, PCB 52 is, is a tetrachloro PCB molecule. It's got a, a log KOC around five-ish. And even then it's ending up with most of, its, most of its mass in the dissolved phase. So you need to go to pretty high molecular weights, PCBs with six, seven, eight chlorines on them before you get a pretty substantial fraction of the mass partitioning onto the particles and the dissolved organic carbon. Uh, okay, so next question, calculate the sedimentation rate. You know that the rate that the particles settle is 0.7 meters per day. That, that's what was given. And that's, you know, it's a typical rate at which particles settle the world over. That's just what particles do. Um, but the rate at which your chemical settles is this rate times this times the fraction that is actually sticking to the particles, which is right here, the POC. So its effective rate of settling is much, much slower because not very much of it is sticking to the particles. So that's way too many significant figures. Eh, that's good. Two significant figures is always good. Any more than that seems crazy. Okay. Uh, and so that's the rate at which particles settle. We know that the depth of the harbor is about point, about five meters. That's again, a pretty typical value. You could look at Chesapeake Bay. Uh, you could look at a lot of like the Biscayne Bay, a lot, a lot of bays and creeks and stuff are gonna be around that depth. Um, it just seems sort of an equilibrium between the scouring and the, the de deposition of particles and stuff. So it's a big settling basin is what it is. And so if I calculate my half-life, so first I'm gonna, before I do that, I'm gonna calculate my rate constant, my K, K for sedimentation. And that would be this 0.27 meters per day divided by the depth here. Okay, and so I took meters per day and I divided it by meters. So my units here are one over days. And hopefully you remember from, you know, Gen Chem that one over time is the units of a first order reaction rate constant. So that's the rate constant. But you know, it's hard for us conceptually to think about one over days. Like what, what does that mean? So we like to convert this to a half-life, which is the natural log of two divided by this one over days. And since you just took the inverse of one over days, this now has units of days. So this is your half-life with respect to settling. 126 days. That I can wrap my head around, right? I don't understand what 0. 0.0055 per day means, but I get 126 days. After 126 days, half of all the, the PCB52 will have been lost from the system due to settling. There's other processes going on that are also causing the PCB52 to be lost, but just due to settling, it's going to take 126 days. So how does the, this compare to the flushing? Uh, it is much longer. So flushing is more important, is more important as a loss process than settling. That's true for PCB 52, but for other chemicals that you might have as your homework, you might, might, might get a much shorter half-life here. If you have a larger fraction sticking to the particles, you'll get a much shorter half-life. Now, by the way, uh, particle half-life, would just be the 0.7 meters per day divided by the five meters. So that would be, sorry, this would be the first order rate constant. This would be the rate constant. It would be 0.14 per day. And the half-life would be natural log of two divided by this. So that would be four days, about five days. So what that tells you is that if your chemical was 100% on the particles, this is what your settling half-life would be. Instead of 126 days, it would be only about five days. So if your chemical is completely 100% stuck to particles, it's settling very rapidly and settling becomes the most important loss process, right? 
But if it's only part partially stuck to the particles, then settling is less important. So it all depends on the nature of your chemical and what its physical chemical properties are, how much of it actually sticks to the particles. And then I was asking you to calculate an isotherm using the, the uh, Freundlich equation. And so the KOC value that we came up with here was up here somewhere. Where's my KOC? Here's my KOC in the presence of salt. There we go. Um, so I can calculate my CS value as just being equal to what I'm assuming the KF is equal to K KOC. It's going to have different units. Don't worry about that. Uh, times CW here to the N power. N is always going to be in this row 65. So I'll put the dollar sign there. And let's see, C64, that's always going to be C64. And the concentration here in the water column is always going to be in column A. So if I get all my, um, if I get all my dollar signs right, I should in theory be able to just click and drag this and see if it works out okay. Why is it the same for all of them? That doesn't make much sense, does it? I guess, huh? is that right? Let me just make sure. Yeah, okay, seems to be right. So let us now plot this. And here's, you can see your isotherms here. And the point is, point, uh, let, me, let me do this over again one more time. Hold on, let's do it this way. I did practice this, I really did. I'm going to just move that out of the way and I'm going to put the end values here so that I can see that on my legend. Okay, so this, if I plot it and I'm going to insert and I'm going to put in a plot that just has lines and not figures and that's all effed up. Hold on. <laughs> run away, run away. Here we go. Oh God, okay, here we go. Put it this way. Eh. Eh. There we go. So there's my plot. These are the different end values. Uh, and the idea is that hopefully you can see if I make it real big, you ho hopefully can see some curvature going on here. Now, when N is equal to one here, there is no curvature, it's just a straight line. But for all of these others, they start at the same place, but they start to curve downward. And they curve downward more when the end value is smaller. There's more curvature, they, they don't quite rise to that level. So I was just making you plot a Freundlich isotherm, kind of see the effect of N, of the N value on the Freundlich isotherm. So what this is telling you is that as the concentration in the water increases, the amount that's absorbed as a proportion, the, the, the equilibrium constant, the KD value, gets smaller and smaller. If, there's, if you have a, uh, an exponent less than one here, so that there's downward curvature, as you get to higher and higher concentrations, less can be absorbed. Uh, so hopefully in the New York, New Jersey Harbor, we're not up in these high regions, you know, we're certainly not up in the milligram per liter region um, where we have concentrations that high, thank God, you know, if we did, we'd be in big, big trouble, you know, PCBs in the New York, New Jersey Harbor, last time I checked, which was a while ago, we're hovering around, I don't know, maybe five or 10,000 picograms per liter, so a picogram per liter is, is a thousand picograms per liter is a nanogram, so five to 10 nanograms per liter. So certainly not getting anywhere near the milligram per liter mark, um, but that's not really so much the point. The point is just to show you that there is this curvature going on. So that's a quick and dirty uh, video of how to do homework number seven. I uh, hope that you'll have uh, great luck with it and not need any more help. But if you do, I'm always here. Please go ahead and ask me questions anytime you need me. Oh, I can't figure out how to turn it off.